<clears throat> if you… if anybody didn't have this chart which we gave last night, you can collect it. Take one and see if somebody else needed it. the teacher is discussing the mode of creation, explaining this creation of the universe, basically to show the unity that is obtaining in the diversity <coughs> or the correlation that obtains between the Vyasti and Samasti it is individual and total. And to explain that, this model has been selected, as we said, the model of five elements. Atatha chatur vimsati tattvot patti prakaram vakshyamaha. Now we shall explain the more of the origin of the twenty-four essential principles. Or so the universe is looked upon as made up of these twenty-four principles. <coughs> All of these basically are five principles, five elements. And five elements also ultimately emerge only from one element space. And that also ultimately emerges from the primary cause which is called Maya. And that also is nothing but the appearance of Brahman. So, as the text explains, this universe can be looked upon as consisting of twenty-four 
principles. And we shall see how these 24 principles ultimately have emerged from three elements, uh, five elements. These five elements have emerged from one element space. That one element is emerged from the primary cause Maya, and Maya is ultimately nothing but appearance of Brahman. Therefore, the idea is to show how this whole, whole universe is manifestation of Brahman, manifestation of Ishvara, manifestation of God. <coughs> And then we have said Brahma Shreya Satparajastama Gunatmika Mayasti that there is this Maya which is which consists of Satparajas and Tamas which is totally dependent upon Brahman or, or has its locus in Brahman. <coughs> in fact, Brahman in its true nature is devoid of any attributes, it's attributeless or transcends all the attributes. And therefore, it cannot have any real attribute. Maya cannot be real. Maya cannot be a real attribute, meaning that Maya cannot have the reality which Brahman has. So, Maya has the apparent reality or what we call it is Mithya. <coughs> and therefore, it does not count as two. Most important thing is that Maya does not count as two. If you want to count the number of entity, a number of realities, then Brahman is one reality, Maya does not count as a separate reality. <coughs> Just as I have a shadow, the shadow does not count as a separate thing. It is included with my body. If I am standing in front of a mirror, there is a reflection, but reflection does not count as a separate entity. Otherwise, it would be difficult, you know, like this. Uh, what is it, this, uh, uh, the husband, you know, go and tells his wife, now, you know, make breakfast for, uh, you know, two people. What is it? Because he saw one, you know, there in the bathroom. He saw one in the bathroom. So, who did you see? Let me see. Then she comes and says, hey, but then there must be three, you know. And so, well, what you see in the mirror is not to be counted as a separate entity. And so if you order, have to order breakfast, a cup of tea, you don't take into account the reflections because they are included in the image itself. So, the, even though there may be an appearance of the two, that does not mean that there are really two, just as reflection appears to be a second entity, but it is not. And so also, Maya is not the second entity. Important thing to understand, the whole, uh, the whole discussion here, is not so much to describe the creation or to give reality to creation or universe, but to explain non-duality. This is a Vedantin's way of establishing non-duality by explaining that what we call duality is not real, is mithya, is apparent. And therefore it is said that maya asti what is the primary cause of creation? It is called Maya. Maya means magic or Maya means the projecting power, which means that this whole universe is a projection and a projection does not count as a separate entity because it does not have a reality of its own. Just as the rope snake does not have a reality of its own. And therefore, even though somebody may see a snake, and somebody a garland, and somebody a stick, and thus many people may see various things, but still, they are not counted as separate entities because they do not have an independent existence, they are only appearances of the rope. So this is to be understood very clearly, that when Vedanta talks about Maya, it does not talk about an independent principle, does not talk about another reality, it just wants to explain how Brahman, which is one and non-dual, how that alone appears as the creation, and therefore there is something called appearance that you would accept. We cannot dismiss the universe that we experience as non-existent because we experience it. Just as in case of a rope snake, we cannot say that the snake is not there because I do experience it. We cannot say that the snake is because when I approach there nearby and show a torchlight to investigate what it is, 
then there is no more snake, what is his role? Inasmuch as the snake does not remain upon inquiry, therefore we cannot say the snake is. However, until that inquiry takes place, or until the knowledge of rope takes place, the snake is real for the person who pursues the snake, and that person also suffers from fear and other reactions. Therefore, we cannot say the snake is not. So, that about which it cannot be said that it is, nor can it be said it is not, is called mithya. If you say something is not, well, like the horn on my head, it is not. In that case, it is non-existent. And Brahman always is. So, satkim, what is sat? Trikalepi tishthatevi sat. That which obtains in all the three periods of time. Sat or Brahman is that which can never not be. It always is. So, these two things are very clear to us. That Brahman or truth is always is and therefore we can say it is. And the horn on my head is not and therefore we say it is not. But what about the rope snake? What in which category? These are the two categories that our intellect and understand. Our intellect and understand is and is not. But this rope snake is a very peculiar thing. This poor intellect is not able to arrive at and understand your conclusions to what it is. It cannot say it is not because it experiences, nor can it say it is because it does not persist, it disappears or it is negated. And so the rope snake has to be accounted for, but we must know that the snake is not to be counted as an entity separate from the rope. By counting the rope, the snake is already counted and therefore even though for the person who perceives the snake, there is some entity called snake, still is not counted as second entity, meaning that it does not have any reality of its own. Therefore, even though you see a snake and a garland and various other things, still the entity there is only rope, one without a second. So how do we establish the oneness, oneness means non-secondness of the rope is by understanding that the snake or the garland are mithya, they are just appearances, they are not tangible entities. Similarly also Vedanta says Sadeyosumi idamagrasit ekamevadvityam Upanishad says that the truth is one without a second, Brahman is one without second less one. But we see so many entities. The universe is full of multiplicity, full of manyness, full of diversity. So, on the face of the experience of diversity, Upanishad says that there is only one and no second less one. Then how do we explain this diversity and manyness or, or multiplicity? Only if it appears but is not really there. Like the snake appears but is not really there and therefore the snake is not counted as an entity separate from the rope and so also the world appears alright but it, if it is an appearance then it is not to be counted as an entity separate from Brahman. So this is all that Vedanta wants to explain through the process of creation. So when creation is elaborately described and systematically described. One should not go with the idea that Vedanta is describing a real creation or the description implies that the creation or universe is real. But Swamiji, if it is Mithya, then why does Upanishad talk about it? Just to convey that it is Mithya. The only purpose why Vedanta talks about creation is to convey that it is Mithya. And in case that does not become very clear in studying Upanishads, therefore then it becomes a discussion in Brahma Sutra, etc. as to how do we understand those passages. But texts like Tattva Buddha make it very clear by saying that the cause of the universe is Maya. Maya means the projecting power, which means that 
the universe is nothing but a projection. It is nothing but an appearance. Therefore, before describing the method or the mode of this creation, the text says, Brahmasya Satvarajas Tamagunatmika Maya Asti. There is Maya, which is totally dependent upon Brahman. Meaning Maya does not have an existence of its own. It existence to Maya is imparted with Brahman. Maya does not shine on its own. The, the awareness or sentience is imparted by Brahman. And there was Satta Sphurti. The Satta and the Sphurti, the existence and the activity that Maya has are totally on account of Brahman. <coughs> so, this does two things. Number one, it establishes that the creation being a product of Maya is Mithya and therefore it is not, it's not real. And number two, it also establishes that in the process of creation, Brahman has nothing to do. That Brahman does not participate in the process of creation, it is Maya that does it all. And thus this whole creation, sustenance, dissolution, all of these drama takes place in presence of Brahman. As Lord Krishna says, Maya Dakshena Prakritihi Suyate Sacharacharam He Tunane Nakaunteya Jagat Vipari Vartate. Hey Arjuna, it is my Dakshara, it is merely in my presence, my awareful presence, that Prakriti or the Maya performs this play of creation, sustenance and dissolution. So whereas when all of this happens, Lord Krishna says that I am not doing anything. At first in the ninth chapter of the Gita, Lord Krishna says that Sarva Bhutani Kaunteya Prakritim Yanti Mamikam Kalpakshay. Hey Arjuna, at the end of the cycle of creation, all the beings merge into my Prakriti, into the primordial cause. And Punastani Visrujami, at the beginning of the next cycle of creation, again I bring them forth. Bhuta Grama Sevayam, Bhutva Bhutva Pralya, and again and again, thus this whole universe, so Prakritim Swam Vashtabhya Visrujami Punah Punah. Thus building my Prakriti, I bring forth this creation again and again. And so it's a cyclic process that the creation is brought forth from Prakriti, primordial cause. At the end of the cycle, it merges back into the cause. So from cause to the effect, back from effect to the cause. From unmanifest to the manifest, from manifest to the unmanifest. From the seed to the tree, from the tree to the seed. This is how the cyclic process goes on. So Lord Krishna says, Prakritim Swama Vashtabhya Visrujami Punah Punah Wielding my Prakriti or my Maya or creative power, I bring forth the creation again and again. So Lord, you are the creator. This is your agenda. This is what you have done. You mean you made this person poor and this person rich? And this person, you know, you have done all this? Then you seem to be partial to some people, cruel to some other. And then you will be bound by the, if the creation is real, then God will be taken trust as to why he has created like this. Why did he make me like this? And why did he make somebody else like that? Then he also will be accountable for dharma and adharma because there seems to be partiality and cruelty in this creation. So Lord Krishna says that in spite of doing all of this, Nachamam Tani Karmani Nibad Nanti Dhananjaya. Hey Dhananjaya, hey Arjuna, this whole creation, I mean the whole action of creating, sustaining, dissolving, it does not bind me in any way. So on one hand he says, I did everything. On the other hand he says, this does not bind me at all. But if you did everything, how come it doesn't bind you? How come you are not accountable for it? 
udasina udasina asattam teshu karmasu because when this process of creation sustain and dissolution goes on i am udasina i am a non participating witness but then how can creation take place if you do not participate if you do not do it maya adhyakshana prakriti sacharacharam suyaje it is in my presence that this prakriti does this creation sustenance dissolution in my very presence there is no kartrutva there is no doership in me lord says there is no doership there is no enjoyership all that is is total presence the wholeness the fullness the consciousness is i'm present and just in my presence this maya or the prakriti gets energized and it is nature of prakriti to bring forth this creation sustain it and, and we draw it back it just happens so those two things are told to us number one that in what we call god or brahman there is no primary creatorship Although we call him creator, sustainer, dissolver, we call him ordainer, whatever. But all of these designation he gets from the standpoint of Maya or Prakriti. In as much as we see creation going on, therefore we have to call somebody a creator. And creator must necessarily be a conscious being. And Brahman is the only conscious one, and therefore he will be assigned, or he, you know, we will impute. to brahman the role of creation sustenance dissolution we will call it creator sustainer dissolver karma adhyaksha karma phaladata meaning the one who witnesses all the actions and one who dispenses the results of action all these various designations god gets brahman gets but understand all these designation he gets only because we view it from the standpoint of creation from the standpoint of maya because we see creation never we call him creator we see destruction never we call him destroyer we see everything being ordained or everything in order never we call him the one who maintains the order which is right but not from his standpoint when you go to him he says i don't do anything so this is how we understand god i mean the whole evidan to explain us what is god and therefore what is self what is creation if this is clearly understood then alone we will understand the non duality then alone we will understand how everything is whole and complete as it is so to call brahman creator sustainer is or also is right because nobody else can be creator but really creator ship sustainer is all in maya but still in as much as maya insentient and therefore it does not cannot function independently it can only function in presence of brahman therefore even the maya is a create in a primary sense but still brahman also can be called create in a secondary sense because without brahman this would not have happened <coughs> so therefore to call brahman or god as creator sustainer dissolver is only in a secondary sense not in the primary sense in primary sense god or brahman is devoid of any role of any attributes of creator sustainer dissolver and therefore he is beyond all the attributes he is untouched by the upadhi or limitations or any attributes he is beyond all the conditionings is ever unconditional i mean ever free from conditioning free from attributes free from limitation because when there is an attribute there is a limitation moment if god is primarily a creator if god is great then he is not small if he is good then he is not bad so even if you call him good still it excludes something which is evil and therefore god will be limited so whatever designation we give god if that designation applies in a primary sense and that will limit god therefore ultimately what we call god is beyond all the designations it includes all the designations at the same time he transcends all the designations 
like an actor. In this actor, the beggar, the king, minister, all of them are included. At the same time, he transcends all of them. So who is a beggar? You will see this alone, the actor alone is because without him there is no beggar. So from the standpoint of the beggar, this fellow is begging. But from his standpoint, I am not doing anything. Because in his mind, there is no identification of the beggar. He is very clear, I am an actor, I am multi-millionaire, even when he is begging. And similarly also, law, all the attributes, so Lord is in all the attributes. He is immanent, all pervasive. At the same time, he transcends all the attributes. So this is the nature of God that Vedanta teaches us. Since he is immanent, all pervasive, therefore whatever is, is God. He is his manifestation. But we should not think that by manifesting that he has become this universe, he has become limited. No, even while appearing as this universe, he remains limitless. And all of this is conveyed by this one sentence. Brahmashraya Maya Asti. There is Maya which has its locus on in Brahman. <clears throat> what it means is that, that explains the creation because there is Maya, the creative power, therefore the creation is, but creation is the nature of projection or appearance, no more than that, but that's all magic can do. Maya means magic. All that magic can do is to create only an appearance. Magic cannot create something real. A magician also cannot transform a piece of newspaper into a hundred dollar bill. In the reality, he can create an appearance. If it really takes place, it's not magic, then it may be something else. Although we call it miracles and stuff like that. But then, if you accept the science, then, then something cannot come out of nothing. So, magic cannot create anything. Magic only can create appearance. <coughs> And Maya means magic. Therefore, Maya cannot create anything, it just create an appear, creates an appearance. To show that this whole universe of diversity and multiplicity is an appearance, is a projection comparable to the projection which is there in the dream. Comparable. Just in the dream also, there is this creation of multiplicity and diversity. And, however, when we wake up, we know that there was no such thing, it was a projection of my mind. And so also, this what we call the waking world also, is a similar reality, it is also a projection. Not as fleeting as dream. It is, this projection is a very, uh, you know, long term projection. The dream is a very fleeting projection, very unclear also. This is all tangible, this looks tangible. And this is ongoing day after day. When I dream today, then it is not a continuity of yesterday's dream, understand? Therefore in dream there is no verification. But here, what I see today is what was there yesterday. In that way, as far as Vyavahara, as far as the, the uh, our transaction is concerned, the dream world is different from, waking world is different from dream. But as far as the reality is concerned, both are the same reality in as much as both of them are projections. One is the projection of the individual mind, other is the projection of the total mind. One we call Jiva Sushti, creation of the individual, other is what we call the Ishvara Sushti, creation of Ishwara. But the nature of creation is similar, both are projections and therefore both are Mithya. <coughs> to distinguish the two, one is called Pratibhasik Satta, other is called Vyavaharik Satta, one is called subjective reality, then the dream, and this is called objective reality, but in fact certain texts do not even make these distinctions. Like Mandukya Karika does not make distinction between 
the pratibhasika and vyavaharika or subject or object is only lumps together, lumps both of them as projections. So deep sleep is characterized by adarshanam and the dream and vegya character are viparita darshanam. When deep sleep is there, where you don't see anything. And dream and waking are those where you see the projection. <coughs> so, that is the whole idea of discussing the srishti or creation. Number one, that it is a product of maya. And therefore it is mitya. So, mitya is the effect and maya is the cause. And there this is all done by maya in presence of Brahman, therefore, there is no creatorship in Brahman. Brahman ever remains devoid of or transcending all the attributes, it therefore remains limitless, attributeless. <coughs> so that is the whole idea. And then comes all this description. That is for our own understanding, for our own uh, satisfaction. Because human mind wants to understand how did this thing come about. And therefore, this description is given for our own satisfaction. If you are content by knowing there is mithya and you don't care for the details, then you need not worry about this. But for us, the universe is so tangible. Why did this happen? Uh, you know. So we want to know because it's... After all, we live in this world. We are impacted by the world. And world causes us sorrow and, and pleasure and pain. And therefore, as long as world is very important, as long as I call, think it is tangible, as long as it impacts me, so long it becomes necessary to understand, so long we should know the various laws governing this world, so that we can understand and we'll know how to relate to them. So this description helps us how to relate to the world. It also will tell us, how there is unity in all this diversity. How there is an interrelationship between the individual and the total. So thus, certain harmonies, the, the, the harmonies, the orders that are obtaining will also become very clear from this description. <coughs> thus, in the process of creation, we were told that first the five elements emerge. Akasha, Vayu, Agni, Apaha, Prasavi. So we gave you this chart, and in this chart you can, as we said last night, the very first is Maya, dependent upon Brahman, Sattva Rajasthamas, from there subtle Tanmatras, space, giving rise to air, giving rise to fire, giving rise to water, giving rise to earth. And Maya has a three aspects, Sattva Rajasthamas, therefore every element that has emerged from Maya also has a three aspects, Sattva Rajasthamas. And first, the text explains us the evolution of the sattva aspect of the of the of Maya. So we are told how each the sattva aspect of each element gives rise to the organ of perception. Because knowledge is sattva is sattva is where the knowledge takes place. Rajas is where activity takes place. Tamas is where there is inertia. So therefore, we have these organs of knowledge called the Jnanendriyani, organs of knowledge or organs of perception. Therefore, organs of knowledge are naturally evolved from the sattva aspect. We have organs of action, they would evolve, be evolved from the rajas aspect because rajas means activity. And then we have this gross body which is inert, then it is evolved from the tamas aspect. So if you look at our own personality, we ourselves are made up of these three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. We have these organs of perception or organs of knowledge. And we have the mind that goes behind these organs of knowledge. So all of these become the equipment that we have for gaining knowledge. Then all of this is created from sattva. Then we have the organs of action. And with the prana, the vital air, which in fact, which, uh, which, which, uh, which, is, which gives the power for this action, all of this is action, therefore, the products of rajas. And then our gross body is inert, is made up of tamas. 
So our personality also is created from sattva, rajas and tamas. And so also the whole universe is created from sattva, rajas and tamas. <coughs> so we were told how from the sattva aspect of the element space, ear or the faculty of hearing, from the sattva aspect of element air, we have skin or the organ of touch, sattva aspect of fire, eyes, the organ of seeing, sattva aspect of water, is tongue, the organ of taste, sattva aspect of earth, which is nose, the organ of smell. These five organs of perception are they have evolved from the sattva aspect of the five corresponding elements. <coughs> and then we are told that from the combined total sattva aspect of all the five elements, as you see in the chart, we have the antahkaranam, the inner organ. So you have to trace these lines rather carefully. You see there are three kinds of lines are there. One are solid lines, other are dotted lines, and third is uh, whatever it is called, you know, the third is uh, chain line, that's right. So solid line, dotted line, and chain line. Solid line for sattva, dotted line for rajas, chain line for tamas, okay, so, so that you can trace them. <coughs> So if you see the solid lines coming from sattva aspect, all the solid lines then add up to what you call the antahkaranam or inner organ and then that solid line goes down to show the four manas, buddhi, chittam and ahankara. So, so far we saw last night. We are on the page 30 when we read this passage. Edesham pancha tattvanam samasti satvikam sat mano buddhi hankar chittantah karanani sambhudani. Edesham pancha tattvanam samasti satvikam sat from the total sattva aspect. So, from individual sattva aspect, the individual organs of perception. Now, we know that the sense organs can perceive only when they are backed by the mind. That is, ears can hear only when they are backed by the mind. If the mind is elsewhere, if you are absent-minded, then even though the sound may fall on the eardrums, we will not hear, the hearing will not take place if the mind is not behind the ears. And so also, this, no sense perception will take place unless the mind is behind that respective sense organ. So eyes can see, provided the mind is behind the eyes. Even tongue can taste if the mind is behind that. Sometimes people are so absent-minded even when eating their food. So preoccupied with, you know, he is very, is is uh, is in a great hurry, he has to rush to the work. And he's so preoccupied with the idea of what else he has to do after reaching office, he just finishes his food. Doesn't even know what he's eating. So how do you like it, my son? Wonderful, mother, wonderful. That's all. Only when mom eats the food, then she finds out that there was no salt in the dal and there was no this. So how did he eat this thing? But he didn't know what he was eating. When the mind is not behind the sense organ, then we cannot, the sense organ cannot function. It is, we do not get the sense perception. That cognition does not take place. Therefore, the mind is always involved in every function of knowing. And in as much as a given sense organ only senses one object, therefore it is made of the sattva aspect of one element, as we explained yesterday in the correspondence, how the faculty of hearing, the ear is not what we mean by the faculty of hearing. The subtle part, the subtle faculty of which ear is the place of manifestation, that is called the, the faculty of hearing and that is the product of the sattva aspect of the element space and the faculty of hearing perceives the sound which is the quality of space. So that's correspondence. The other chart will show you how that correspondence is there. <coughs> Our mind is behind each one of the five organs of perception. That is mind is involved in hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, everything. Therefore it is right that mind is made up of the 
combined sattva aspect of all the five elements. So, and the mind in English is called antahkaranam in here in Vedanta. Antahkaranam is inner organ. As compared to the organs of perception and organs of action, they are called external organs. So, thus we have two kinds of organs, external organs and inner organ. So, organs of perception are external organs because they are in contact with the external world. And the mind is inner organ because then it receives the data from the sense organ and then processes, you know. Because when you know that this is a flower or this carnation, suppose you come to this conclusion, then that is the result of uh, the the perception, the, the perception taking place at different levels. So I see the flower, I see the color, eyes only give me data that this is color. You don't know whether it's a real flower or not, so then you have to touch it, you know. So then my organ of touch gives me the that this is soft touch. Okay. You might still need certain verification, then you may smell it. So organ of smell gives me the data of only smell. You may want to still further qualify, you know, and take a pattern and taste it. It is real or what it is. So thus, in order to determine what this object is, all the organs of perception may be involved. Each organ of perception only gives us a particular data. This data is synthesized in the mind. The eyes do not say that this is a flower, it just says what color it is. The organ of touch tells me how the touch is. The organ of smell tells me what the smell is. That smell can be from flower, it can be from anything. The touch can be a flower of any other object. And color can be of the flower or any other object. So all this data is synthesized in the mind based on the past memory and then the mind comes to the conclusion that this is carnation, this is jasmine, this is rose, whatever. So this synthesis takes place in the mind. Although we think that the eyes see and eyes determine, eyes don't determine, eyes just determine the color. Because there may be a picture of, of fire, they can, these colorful flames are shown, eyes will report the color. It is the mind that will decide whether this is a real fire or is a fire, this is just a picture. And so since therefore, mind is involved with every sense organ. And so the text tells us that the mind is evolved from the combined sattva aspect of all the five elements because mind is involved in perceiving all the five elements. <coughs> now this mind is divided into four, mind performs four functions. Mind is one, but mind is called differently depending upon what function it performs. Just as a person may gain different designations depending upon what action the person performs. He may be called father from one standpoint because he performs one function. He is called husband depending on another function he performs. He is called son also, a third function he performs. He may be called a boss also, a fourth person he function he performs. So the same person can get different designations depending upon the function, the functional names, you know. So if you are if you are a manager, it's the functional name. Even wife also is a functional name. Husband also is a functional name. Son also is a functional name. Basically the person. So you a driver, functional name. Carpenter, functional name depending upon the function that a person performs. So mind performs many functions, but primarily we may say that the mind performs four functions. And depending upon the function the mind performs, it gains a certain name or designation. So the earlier passage said, Mano, Manas, Buddhi, Ahankara, Chitta. So mind gains its four designations depending upon what kind of function it performs. Don't think that there are four minds, there is only one mind. But one mind alone gains different names or designations depending upon what function it is performing at a given time. So 
those functions are next explained. So, the last sentence on the page 30 says, Sankalpa vikalpatma kam manaha Nishyatmika buddhihi Ahankarta ahankrutihi Chintanakartu chittam What is manas? Sankalpa vikalpatma kam manas Sankalpa and Vikalpa. Sankalpa a decision, Vikalpa a doubt. A decision and doubt, decision and doubt. And Ahankar and Nishyatmika Buddhi, Buddhi is that which in fact the decision is the nature of intellect. So look at this, before we come to a decision, our mind goes through a process of inner deliberation of pros and cons. A simple decision of going to the class in the morning. The pros and cons, you know. Yeah, but that's, it's good as Swami, you know, the classes are very good in Tattva Bodha. I think you should come. That is all right, you know, but then uh, there is other thing is involved there and I think therefore, okay. Uh, no, I think I want to go there, not here. Then, no, but this is very good. Yeah, I think we should go there. No, but how about that? I think we should not go there. And thus, mind will have various options before coming to a decision. The mind generally weighs the pros and cons of doing something. And mind itself comes up with different positions. Do this? Yeah, it's a good idea. But then this is a problem here. Do that? That's a good idea. But that's a problem there. And after this, this churning takes place. This state is called manas. So state that obtains before a decision is made, wherein the pros and cons are weighed, where a decision is made and then is questioned, it is made and again questioned, it is made and again questioned. Sometimes we vacillate, you know, from one to the other before coming to a decision. So that state is called manas. That's what they technically call manas. Sankalpa vikalpa atmakam manaha. That state of mind where sankalpa and vikalpa. Sankalpa a resolve, vikalpa an alternative. A resolve an alternative. Sometimes after leaving home, uh, you wonder, did I lock the door? I think I locked it. Did I really do that? Was it yesterday that I locked it or today also I locked it? No, I locked it. I think I haven't locked it. I think I've locked it. I, I haven't locked This business goes on in the mind. Sometimes they go on for 15 minutes, 5 minutes, 2 minutes, 1 second. And ultimately you come to decision, I think I have not locked it, let me go and check. Or I know I have locked it. Sometimes some people try to shake us up, you know. Are you sure you have done it? Yes sir. Are you sure? <laughs> you know. But some people say, I know I have done it, forget it. So when now there is an ascertain, ascertainment or a decision, that state is called buddhi. See, the mind itself was in a certain state, a vacillating state, or a doubting state, or a deliberating state, or weighing pros and cons. So, that state is called manas. As a result of that, you arrive at a decision finally. In the morning, the alarm, alarm rings. Shut it off. Do I want to wake up? I think it's a good idea, you know. Then only I can go to the meditation. Yeah, but that's every day. Then I sleep one day. Okay. Then again, no, no, I think you should go there. No. Just go on for... Sometimes it goes on so long that the meditation goes away also. <laughs> but it may go on for some time. So mind says, no, no, but I, I slept very late last night. I didn't have enough sleep. And then I said, no, no, but Swami will ask you, how come you did not come, you know? <laughs> so this process will go on. Ultimately, decision will be made. Now we have to go or forget it, one of the two. Then only that is, the mind is at peace. Until then there is no peace. So once a decision is made, then you are at peace. Then you can sleep, have another half an hour of sleep, or you get up and do what is necessary. And that does not happen until a decision is made. So the deciding state of the mind is a different state, it is called buddhi. It is a state of mind or the mode of mind that is called buddhi here. 
And that earlier state, when we are going through the deliberations or vacillation or doubting etc., that is called the state of mind called manas. <clears throat> so sankalva vikalpatmakam manah. And all of these term in terms you will come across when you study other texts and when you study Bhashya and Tika. They will take for granted that all these definitions are known to us and therefore they will say sankal vikalpa what is this? But then if you have studied this you know what it is that they mean. So nishayatmika buddhi, sometimes adhyavasaya atmika buddhi, the decision is also adhyavasaya or nishaya. So adhyavasaya madhi or nishayatmika buddhi. So nishayatmika antahkana vritti buddhi, this is how the definition is. That mode of mind which is characterized by decision is called buddhi. Or sankalpa vikalpa atmika antahkana vritti manaha. That mode of mind which is characterized by sankalpa and vikalpa, by decision and doubt. The third state of mind is called ahankara. Ahankarta ahankriti. So one that, which character the idea of I. So understand in our own mind itself there are two kinds of thoughts. Part of our mind keeps thinking and doing things. There is another part of the mind that is watching it also. For example, a sudden thought comes to my mind. And I say, that's excellent, you know. So a thought comes and I also know that the thought has come. And so the thought is one that is known to I who is a knower. So in the mind itself, understand there are two divisions, known and knower. The knower part is called aham vritti. The known part is called the idam vritti. So mind itself has two kinds of thoughts, idam vritti and aham vritti. This thought and I thought. So therefore we find sometimes the dialogue takes place in our own mind. We are talking to ourselves. Meaning one part is talking to the other part. The aham part, the I, is the one who watches the world, watches its own mind. So for example, memory. So when I am thinking, then also there is a thinker and the process of thinking. Remembering, there is a rememberer and the process of remembering. Decision, a decision maker and decision. Sankal vigalpa, a doubter and doubting. So when in my mind this doubting etc. takes place, there is an awareness. When the decision takes place, then also there is someone who knows. When memory takes place, a remembrance, then someone who knows. So that knower, or the, that is called the subject. So that is the subject vritti, the subject mode of the mind and the object mode of mind. See, the mind has therefore two kinds of thoughts, object and subject. Karana and Karta. In, in Sanskrit they are called Karanam and Karta. So even though we call it Antah Karanam, but in Antah Karanam itself there is a Karta. So of the four Vrittis that we are told, the three are Karana. The Manas, Buddhi and Chittam, these are the Karana or they are the instrument or the organ and Aham Vritti is the Karta, the subject or the doer. <coughs> So this uh, we should know and you, when you will think about this you will yourself find out that yes, in fact the thoughts are taking place in my mind, different kinds of thoughts, decisions take place and there is someone who knows this decision, someone who knows the decision, that's a knower, that's a subject, that is the aham vritti. So aham vritti and idam vritti. As Ramana Maharshi says, manasantukim Margane krute neva manasam marga arjavat. When we inquire into what is this mind, then the mind does not remain. So then the inquiry proceeds. Vruttyastvaham vruttima siddhaha vruttyomano vidyaham manaham. That there are two kinds of vrutti, the two kinds of thoughts. So instead of four thoughts, the thoughts can be divided into two also. In a different way. One is the I thought. Other is rest of the thoughts, which you can say this thought. One is the I thought, the subject thought, others are the object thoughts, which are objectified by the subject. 
<coughs> and that object thought alone is further divided into manas, buddhi and chittam. And ahankarta is aham thought, I thought. So therefore, in our mind, there is this thought called I, 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 I. I am the knower, I am the thinker, I am the seer, I am the doer, I am the enjoyer. You see, when I say I am the enjoyer, what am I enjoying? Understand that I am enjoying my own mind. When I am watching a movie and enjoying, then those thoughts of the movie take place in my mind, which I watch, and there is a watcher who watches all those thoughts. And therefore, there are two things going on together. One is the one who is watching, other is what he is watching. And we are always watching our mind, even though we think that we are watching the world, but the world can be watched provided the corresponding thoughts take place in our mind. We say that perception can take place only when there is a corresponding cognition, thought. I can perceive this flower or cognize the flower only when the flower thought takes place in my mind. So there is a flower thought. And there is one who knows the flower thought, you see. The flower can be cognized only when the flower thought takes place in my mind. So that is a thought. And then I say that I know the flower. So there is a knower of the flower, knower of the thought. The knower is the subject and the flower thought is the object of knowledge. So thus in our mind itself, there are two kinds of thoughts, object and subject. In idam vritti, aham vritti. Idam means this. Aham means I. Sometimes the rhythm root is called karanam. So thought called karanam and thought called karta. These two thoughts are there. And this karanam or the object thought alone is further divided into manas, buddhi and chittam. <coughs> so ahankarta, ahankruti, the one, the thought there is characterized by I. The thought characterized by being subject is called ahankara. This ahankara is not pride and stuff like that. Ahankara is just the thought characterized by I-ness. Because there are thoughts characterized by this-ness. In our mind itself, there are thoughts that are characterized by this-ness. This flower, this thought. And thoughts characterized by I-ness. So that thought characterized by I-ness is called ahankara. And other thoughts are further divided into, as we said, manas. The thought is all sankalpa vikalpa, or is buddhi, minishya or decision, or for this chintana kartra chittam. Or sometimes when you are deli- when you are inquiring or remembering. So anusandhana atmika antah kana vrutti chittam. Sometimes they say that, that mode of the mind which does anusandhana, which remembers the past. So that memory or remembrance is a specific mode of the mind. Decision is another mode of the mind. And vacillation or doubting is yet another mode of mind. So basically these three modes of mind are recognized. In Chittam, you also think of memory. Sometimes when you are thinking, when you are thinking about something, inquiry about, inquiry, some, deliberating upon something, you take this flower and then you wonder, what is this flower? Where does it come from? What is its nature? So, this kind of inquiry, all of this takes place in chittam. So, that mode of the mind where this chintanam, say chintana karatva chittam. Chintanam means thinking, deliberating, inquiring, that also can be included in chittam. And then, at, at, at you then come to a decision, you can call it buddhi. <coughs> so, thus, the one mind performs these four functions, therefore, it gains its four designations, manaha, buddhihi, ahankara and chittam. <coughs> it's only one mind, but different states are there. <coughs> sometimes, then sometimes they only call it two, manaha and buddhihi. So instead of four, sometimes they just call it two. Then the other two are merged, included in the other one. So sometimes ahankara is included with manas, and chittam is included with buddhi. And they say manaha and buddhi. So if you remember the description of the subtle body, the seventeen parts, the five organs of perception, five organs of action, the five prana, and manas and buddhi, they did not include the other two. So
So we should understand that other two are included with manas and buddhi. <coughs> so sometimes mind is divided into two categories, manas and buddhi, the hair and the heart they call it, or sometimes into the four as we just saw. So both these you will come across. So that is how the evolution of what we call the mind, which is from the combined sattva aspect of all the five elements. <coughs> and naturally, each one is a presiding deity. And so, next passage tells us, Manaso Devata Chandramaha Buddhir Brahma Ahankarasya Rudraha it's interesting. Each mode of the mind also has a presiding deity. Meaning that that function takes place by the grace of that presiding deity. So, Manas Chandrama. Chandrama means the moon. Is a presiding deity of the function called Manas or the mind. <coughs> of emotions. So, Manas also is the emotional faculty. The reacting faculty. And Chandra, the Manas, is the presiding deity of the emotional faculty. Well, naturally, because moon always, you know, invokes the emotions in people. So, and so people who have this in their astrological chart, and then the, uh, this moon is, the, is predominant and the mind is going. So moon vacillates. Moon is never steady. It always waxes and wanes. And so the people whose mind keeps on waxing and waning, or they never steady. There are some people who cannot be steady, cannot come to a decision. Always go back and forth, back and forth. And so, that state is manas. And that is because of the predominance of chandrama, in the astrology, whatever, the karma, whatever it is. But then, so manas is the presiding deity of the, this mind. Therefore, if you go to lunatic asylums on certain days, like the full moon, night, etc., the activity will be different because the minds are affected. There are certain dates when the minds are particularly affected. Ashtami also is a date like that. And this, this uh, poor full moon also is a date like that, which does affect the mind. And people look hilarious, you know, and then because the moon is full. So it is an experience also that this Chandrama or the moon has an influence upon our mind. Buddha Brahma. Buddha is a deciding faculty. And that is the most important faculty, really, the deciding faculty, the knowing faculty also. Brahma, the creator, is said to be the presiding deity of buddhi. <laughs> Brahma also is called Hiranyagarbha. And Hiranyagarbha is symbolized by sun, Surya. And the orb of sun is bright and shining. The intellect also shines. And therefore, sun or Hiranyagarbha or Brahma is said to be the presiding deity of buddhi, the intellect. That's the reason why we pray to the sun deity, for the brilliance of our intellect. So this Gayatri mantra is nothing but the prayer to this, this sun deity, to grant us the, to guide our thoughts and grant us the brilliance of the thought. So sun or Hiranyagarbha or Brahma is the presiding deity of buddhi. The thinking faculty, I mean, I mean, deciding faculty, knowing faculty. Ahankara is Rudra. Rudra is the form of Lord Shiva, which is the ferocious form. It is the destructive aspect of Lord Shiva. So it is Rudra that destroys. So Brahma creates and Vishnu preserves and Rudra destroys. So Brahma Buddhi creates. Then chitta is main, it what maintains, ahankara is what destroys. So wherever ahankara comes, there is always destruction. It is like that Bhasmasura, you know. Bhasmasura was a demon. So wherever he placed his hand, would turn into ash. This was the boon that was given to him, or he, he asked for it. So wherever he put his hand, he would turn to ashes. And so ahankara is like that. Wherever ahankara goes, it all turns to ashes because it, dist- it divides. Ahankara always divides. Ahankara destroys. And Rudra is the deity of destruction. Therefore, Rudra is the presiding deity of ahankara. And therefore, we worship Rudra also to remove the ahankara, 
to remove the ignorance, to gain the knowledge. So Rudra destroys, but it can destroy the ignorance also by granting knowledge. Therefore, we worship Rudra. So therefore, the recital of this Rudram is thought to be very important for those who are seeking knowledge, for removal of ignorance, removal of the obstacles. And Chitta Sivasudeva, Chitta, the presiding deity of the faculty Chitta is Vasudeva, is the preserver. So, creator, preserver, destroyer, and nourisher. The emotions nourish. So, Chandrama is a nourishing principle. You know why this moon is losing its digit every day? From full moon day to the new moon day, the moon loses a digit every day. Because it feeds the devatas. He says that every day moon is the food of the devatas. And so every day it nourishes the devatas, gives them the food, gives itself up. Then devatas give it back to him. And that's how then he's, there is this waxing during the other half. That's how they explain. So moon is the food. Moon is the nourishing principle. And that's, so it nourishes all the other devatas. Brahma, Vishnu or Vasudeva, Rudra and Moon, these are the presiding deities of the four faculties of our mind. <coughs> okay. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Shishyate Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Vashakrita <coughs> Bhagavanta Punaf Punaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmedi Murti Veda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Pyo